Yo, what it do? S R T Gang, it's your boy with the fat swaggy reacts, and we are back with another reaction video, man. And shout out to Mr. Baller, man. He done dropped the video for us, man. Like he normally dropped on Sunday, but he dropped this one yesterday, man. But I mean, I mean, I had to go ahead and give you guys this, man. But the Chinese government has confirmed the paranormal. If he doesn't change the title, you know how Mr. Baller do. So, oh, oh yeah, plus one. I mean, plus our huge announcement. So whatever it is, we're definitely here for it. Like, share, comment, subscribe. We're on the road to 100K. Subscribe to the channel. If you're not, share, share, share. That's the only way that we're gonna grow. One subscriber at a time, and also hit that like button, man. But without further ado, man. Let's get into it. Again, I shout out again to Mr. Baller. Let's get into it, man. Let's go. Hey, everybody. Real quick, I don't normally make announcements at the beginning of stories, but today is different because I have a massive announcement starting right now, today. The Mr. Ballin podcast that rose immediately to the top of the charts when we launched it in 2022 mm -hmm. and then was scooped up by Amazon by the end of the year. Right. Yeah, that show is now available on all podcast platforms mm. and it is free. Uh, now, don't worry if you've been listening free. to this podcast on Amazon Music. That's awesome. You can keep doing that because with your Prime membership, you will get Mr. Ballin podcast episodes one month earlier than everybody mm. else what? and it will be ad free. But again, the show. That's fire, bro. Come on, bro. You got to give it up for Mr. Baller for doing that, bro. He really loves us, dog. Like, he loves his community, bro. Come on, man. It is on every other platform right now. Come and on, it really man. is free. So go ahead and follow the Mr. Baller And again, like, no one, I mean, no one else is doing that, bro. No one else is doing that but Mr. Baller, bro. Come on, bro. You got, like, bro, you got to hit the like button alone just for that. Like, come on, y'all. Cast Strange, Dark, and Mysterious Stories on Amazon Music or wherever else you get your podcasts. For sure, dog. For sure. Today's story is about one of the most famous potentially paranormal events of all time, except almost no Westerners have heard of it because mm. it happened in China. But mm. before we get into that story, if and, you're a fan... And again, bro, you know, in China, they got over like 6 billion people over that motherfucker, so I wouldn't be surprised a lot of things happen over there in China. Not the strange, dark, and mysterious <laughs> delivered in story They got format, a lot of people. And you've come to the right place because that's all we do, and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, please put the like button stapler in Jello. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's story. Late on the evening of July 27, 1977, a 21-year-old farmer named Huang Yan Cho walked down a wide dusty road in the little farming village of Beigao, located in northern China. It had been a very hard day on the rice farm where Huang worked because they were all preparing for the autumn harvest. But even though Huang was totally exhausted and worn down, as he walked down this road, he was whistling an upbeat tune. Because for the first time in a long time, Huang was actually excited about the future. Huang had grown up in a poor family and he hadn't even finished elementary school. He still mm, lived with damn. his parents in a tiny house. Wait, bro, you didn't even finish elementary school? And basically every day of his life was the same. He got up at sunrise, he walked to work, he worked all day until he barely could even stand, and then he would walk home and he would go to bed. But the reason Huang was now feeling kind of excited about his future was because he had just gotten engaged to a beautiful girl in a neighboring village, and their plan was to get married after the autumn harvest. Huang was already hard at work literally building them a house that they could move into after they got married. And in fact, on this particular night, that was where Huang was going. He was going to the property where he was in the middle of building this house, and he was going there not to work on the house anymore, but really just to admire his property. Because again, he was just so excited about the future. Huang turned the corner and his beautiful half-constructed home came into focus. The foundation, the walls, and the ceiling were all complete. All he had left to do was put in the windows and the doors. 
And so Huang walked up and ran his hand over the beautiful brick he'd laid around the outside of the property. Brick was not cheap. He had worked extra hours to afford this brick. And so he was just so proud of it and he ran his hand over it. And then he kind of stepped back and kind of imagined the house when it was all done. And then when he felt satisfied that he had seen enough, he just kind of nodded and turned and just continued walking back towards his home, his parents' home, which was only a few minutes away. When right. Huang got to his home, he went inside and his mom already had a meal made for him. It was just some rice and veggies. And so Huang sat down and began eating and then his parents came over and they began chatting. And then of course the conversation shifted to Huang's upcoming marriage because that's basically all Huang ever wanted to talk about. And then by about 10 p.m. Huang was so tired that he crawled into his bed and he fell asleep almost immediately. The next morning when Huang's parents woke up, they discovered that Huang was not in his bed. Now, this was not totally unusual because they knew their son was a really hard worker and it wasn't unusual for him to wake up really, really early to head out to the farm to begin his work day. But a little while later, the workers at the rice farm where Huang worked, they saw Huang had not come to work. And because that was so out of character for him, one of the workers actually walked to Huang's parents' home to see if he was okay. And right. when Huang's okay. mother found out her son had not shown up to work, you know, she was really worried, but she told this worker, oh, you know, my son must have gone to the house he's building, you know, go over there and see if he's there. But the worker from the rice farm went to Huang's property he was building and nobody was there. And so when he came back and told Huang's mother, this sent her into a total panic because mm. really for her, this was like completely out of character for her son. He would never miss work. He would never just disappear like this. Something was wrong. So Huang's mother sent this rice farm worker to go find her husband and tell him what was going on with Huang. And then in the meantime, Huang's mother just walked outside and began going door to door, asking neighbors if they knew where her son was and if they wouldn't mind coming out and helping her look. Now, at this time, the village of Beigao was a relatively small place where all the residents more or less knew each other. And so it did not take long for the news of Huang being missing to spread all across Beigao, and the community really came out in force to go look for him. And so right. by the afternoon, there were people on bikes riding all around, calling out for Huang. Mm -hmm. People were going to neighboring villages to see if he was there. Another group of villagers went to Huang's fiance's home and they spoke to her, and she had no idea where Huang was. And so right. by about the early Weird. afternoon, when so many people couldn't find any leads to where Huang had gone, it became clear that really nobody had a clue what happened to him. Mm. Now, Beigao at the time was incredibly isolated. This is a small town where most of the people who live there don't have phones, they don't have cars, they ride their bikes everywhere, and there were no roads that connected Beigao to any other place. Now, there was a paved road that went through so, Beigao. Bro, but it, so he could literally be like, bro, he has to be somewhere in there, bro. Because there's no way, like, you know what I'm saying? So he has to be somewhere in here, but people just can't find this nigga. Like, what the hell? He, he can't just disappear. It actually just came to an end on the outskirts of Beigao. So there was just no way to go to other places, right. at least not efficiently. Basically, if you lived in Beigao at the time, there was a finite number of places you could go. And all these people that had gone out looking for Huang had searched all of those places mm. and Huang just was not there. And they discovered his bike was still leaning up against his parents' house and his work clothes, which he wore basically every single day, were still folded up neatly inside of his room. And so wherever Huang was, he was on foot and he was still in his pajamas. That night, Huang's parents would contact the village committee, which was basically like the governing body for Bei Gao. Right. And the village committee decided that this was serious enough because again, they're thinking, this is impossible. Where is this guy? That they decided to contact the police. But when the police got this call, they did not launch an investigation right away because they had limited resources and there was no sign of foul play here. It was very weird that Huang was missing, but he was an adult. And if he wanted to go vanish somewhere, it was kind of like, okay, you know, you're an adult, you can do that. Right. And so Huang's family and the rest of the Beigao villagers were forced to just kind of wait and see if Huang came back. 
But over the next few days, Huang did not come back, mm. and there was still no new information about what might have happened to him. Right. Early on the morning of August 5th, so eight days after Huang went missing, and still by this point, eight there's days, no sign of bro. him, the deputy director of the Beigao Village Committee came running up the road to Huang's parents' house and knocked on the door. When the door opened up, it was Huang's father, and the deputy director handed him a telegram he had just gotten and said, read it. And so Huang's father took the telegram and began reading it. And as he did, his eyes went wide. And then when he was done, he looked up and he was just so confused. Like, what the hell y'all think happened, y'all? What the hell? Like, we think he got kidnapped or some shit? Like, what the fuck? Join Planet Fitness during you got a duck in by aliens. Sale and say big. Get equipment for every oh, workout. Fucking ass, bro. He's fucking ass, bro. Last weekend, I asked old Sega what he wanted to snack on for our Super Bowl 58 watch party. And he said without hesitation, Oh yeah, who y'all got in the Super Bowl, bro? Who y'all got? Chiefs 49, who? Who y'all got? Let me know. Pa, for your menjari vari maluski esotici. Which of course in Italian means, Papa, I just want to eat various exotic mollusks. And so I said, that's just bully. And immediately I booked us a trip to Alaska, we hopped on a fishing boat, and off we went to snatch up a few of those slippery beasts. But unfortunately, about 15 hours into our seafaring voyage, Lung and I realized we had a problem. Our boat captain was not a boat captain. He was just a simple blind kangaroo with vertigo who happened to jump on board before- A blind kangaroo? We laughed and we just didn't notice. We tried to take the wheel from the roo, but he was so strong that he and he drove no, us directly into a storm. And before long, a rogue wave came and capsized the vessel. But luckily, me and old sink how long we lived. And we swam to a nearby island. And when we stepped foot on land, immediately a horde of angry coconut crabs came out of the brush, skittering around, wielding their machetes. <laughs> wielding their machetes. Me and old Lung turned to run. Yo, you know, see, like, like Mr. Bob is cracking under the press of two, because this nigga is... <laughs> Yo, this, this, like, how do he, do he be, like, practicing these stories or something? Like, bro, like, this, like, yo, because he be, yo, he be coming up with some shit. But there was nowhere to go, it was just the ocean. And so standing there, waiting for death, me and Lung did the only thing we could think to do. We signed up for DraftKings. Now, did that save us from the machete-wielding coconut crabs? No! But did it get us jacked up about Super Bowl 58? Ah! Yes, it did. And so once again, this year, we are partnering up with DraftKings to make sure all you fans of the strange, dark, and mysterious out there get access to the very best deals on their platform. And for Super Bowl 58, they got a really good deal. For all customers, there is a bet one, get one, which means you get a bonus bet back to you in the amount of your original wager just for placing a bet. Pretty good. And there are loads of other amazing opportunities for Super Bowl 58 on DraftKings, so go check it out now. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app right now. New customers use promo code Mr. Ballin. Bet $5 on any wager and you'll receive $200 in bonus bets instantly. Again, that's promo code Mr. Ballin only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Yes, sir. DraftKings, let's get it. The telegram had been sent eight days earlier at around 9 a.m. on July 28th. So basically right around the time that Huang's family discovered Huang was missing was when this telegram was sent. But for whatever reason, the telegram had been very delayed. And so they were just receiving this telegram now, eight days later. And the contents of this telegram made no sense. It said that just nine hours after Huang had fallen asleep in his parents' home, he was discovered lying on the sidewalk in the middle of this bustling city called Nanjing, located 600 miles to the Whoa! south of Beigao. Now, the reason Huang's father and the deputy director Whoa! were so confused by this telegram was this was impossible. 
Remember, Juan does not have a car, right. so the only way he could get around was on foot or on his bike, and we know he left his bike by his house, so he's on foot and very likely in his pajamas, and what, he's gonna go 600, 600 miles? miles? I mean, even if he walked the 30 miles to the nearest train station, nine hours, because that's how much time it took from falling asleep to being discovered in the city, that's is crazy. not enough time to go the remaining 570 miles to Nanjing. So Huang's father and the deputy director, they talked about this and they both decided that, you know, this just can't be true. Clearly somebody has mistaken some other person for Huang because he cannot possibly be all the way in Nanjing. Now, this telegram said that Huang was being held in a deportation center in Shanghai, and so Huang's father and the deputy director decided they would send a telegram back to the sender at this deportation center and tell them, hey, if this really is Huang, he should have a very specific birthmark on his wrist. And so when they sent this telegram off, they fully expected to get one back that said, oh, our mistake, you know, it wasn't him. But they got a reply relatively quickly and it said, oh yeah, he's got that exact birthmark. It's what? definitely Huang, but he's very confused. He doesn't really know what's going on. No. And so somebody what from your village is? has to go get him. Huang arrived back home in the middle of August. So about two weeks after he had gone missing. And as soon as he got there, his fiance and his parents were so happy to see him. And pretty soon, a steady stream of friends and neighbors and other family members began coming to Huang's house to talk to him, to hear his story, to hear about what happened. But Huang really didn't understand what had happened to him. And so mostly he just didn't answer any questions he got asked. He just kind of kept his head down and just uh, kept saying, you know, I don't know, I don't know what happened. happened. Don't and then know. really when his family pressed him and said, you know, like, you gotta tell us, you know, this is so crazy, what happened? He would say, look, like, I'm gonna tell you what happened, but I don't even know if I can believe the things I'm gonna tell you. And so Huang would say, you know, all he could remember was he went to bed in his own bed in Beigao. And then the next morning he woke up and he was laying on the sidewalk. And when he opened his eyes, he saw there was this big swimming pool and then near it was a sign that said Nanjing. And so that was how he put together that he was in Nanjing. And then almost immediately, these two police officers wearing all white just kind of appeared out of nowhere. And they walked oh, up to white. Huang, they scooped him up. And without really saying anything to him, they brought him to that deportation center in Shanghai, which is a place where they all white officers. No, like I think that was like some damn, I mean, a crazy house people or something. Like, all oh, white. Anything to him. Nowhere. Immediately, these two police officers wearing all white just kind of appeared out of nowhere and they walked up to Huang, they scooped him up, and without really all saying white. anything to him, they brought him to that deportation center in Shanghai, which is a place where people who seem confused or mentally ill would be sent That's in order to help house. them get home. That's the and that was house. it. That was Huang's entire story, that he just basically woke up in Nanjing with no idea how he got there. And so after he told his family, mm -hmm. they all just kind of looked at him like, Really? Like, that's what happened? That makes no sense. Yeah, that makes but no Wong, sense. But Wong, I mean, he was completely lucid. He was explaining it really specifically and really simply. I mean, he looked and sounded exactly like he normally did, and he seemed very honest as he was telling the story. Over yeah, the next few weeks, kind of... Wong kind of reintegrated back into his life, but things just were not the same. People were now scared of him. I mean, kids literally scared ran away him? from him when they saw him because rumors were going around town that he himself, his body, was haunted or something. And so kids were scared of him and other villagers would openly gossip about him right in front of him. I mean, even his beloved fiance admitted to feeling really uncomfortable around him now. And while mm. all of this was obviously wow. very upsetting for Huang, he did also understand why people were acting this way. I mean, this is a very anomalous thing that's happened to him, right. and he did not have a good explanation for this totally insane event that he was a part of. And so he just kind of got it. And in fact, Huang himself was kind of terrified of himself. I mean, right. at night when he would go to bed, he would be terrified that the second he closed his eyes, he was going to be transported hundreds or thousands of miles away to some totally unknown place, and maybe this time he wouldn't even be able to get back again. But as the days wore on, Huang continued to wake up in his own bed in Beigao, which over time kind of made him feel more secure that whatever happened to him was a one-time thing and it's not going to happen again. However, Huang would be wrong. On September 8th, 1977, mm, so three weeks after Huang had returned back home, he went to sleep in his bed in the village of Beigao, 
but when he woke up the next morning, he was not there. The first thing Huang noticed when he woke up that morning were the sounds around him were totally different. They were not right. Normally, when he was asleep in his home, he would hear the sound of his mother and father snoring right by him, and he might hear some insects or birds out his window, and those sounds were gone. Instead, he heard what sounded like footsteps, but not ordinary footsteps. They were footsteps of somebody walking on cement who was wearing high heels, like a clicking sound. And then Huang also became aware of the fact that his face was clearly pressed up against cement. He was laying on the ground, but Huang couldn't open his eyes. As hard as he tried, he couldn't, couldn't do it. He couldn't eyes. move his body. And so he's just laying there on cement with his eyes closed, listening to the sound of these footsteps, these high heels, getting closer and closer and closer. And as they did, his anxiety was growing and growing. He had no idea who this person was. And then these footsteps, they got right up to him and then passed by him. And Huang felt the breeze as this person walked right past him. And then after this person in high heels had kind of walked off in the other direction, Huang finally was able to wrench open his eyes and he sat up and he looked around and one, he couldn't find anybody. It was totally abandoned all around him. So whoever right? had those totally high heels abandoned. on had somehow vanished in plain sight. And, this is crazy. and then also as Huang continued to look around him, it looked like he was in the middle of this city. But again, there's nobody out there. It's like this abandoned city street. All he had in front of him was this clock up on a building that said 1 a.m. And so pretty soon, Huang was just kind of walking in circles, screaming out for help. And right when he was about to just start sprinting in any one direction in hope that help would be somewhere out there, Huang felt a tap on his shoulder. And then the person tapping him from behind him said, are you Huang Yan Cho? Huang spun around and he saw there were these two men in military uniforms standing there. And for a second, Huang felt relieved. Somebody was here to help him. But then he thought to himself, how do they know my name? What's going on here? And so he asked them, how do you know my name? But the two men didn't answer Huang. Instead, they told him that he was at a Shanghai railway station 700 miles from Beigao. Yo, 700, yo, 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 yo. What is going on, bro? This nigga's just getting farther and farther away from the hell. It was just 600. Now it's 700 miles away. Like what is going on? That they, these two soldiers, were here to take Huang to a nearby army base. At this point, Huang was so scared, he just didn't know what to do. So he just wound up going with these two soldiers who put him in the back of a Jeep. And then they hopped in and began driving and they drove him out of this weird abandoned city where he had woken up. And after driving for some time, they arrived at this huge army base that had all these rows of fencing around it with razor wire on top and no. all these sentries that guarded all the doors. And these two soldiers brought him through several of these checkpoints. And then when they reached the very last one, they stopped the car, they got out, Huang got out too. And the two soldiers that were with him grabbed Huang's shoulders and they basically led him through the last checkpoint, which was manned by armed guards. And as Huang was led through this gate, the armed guards seemed to not even notice the soldiers or Huang. It was like they were invisible to the armed guards. But either way, they got through the final checkpoint and then the two soldiers that were carrying Huang led him to this kind of nondescript big building mm. and they opened up a door and they began right. walking down this long hallway that kind of zigged and zagged. It was like a maze of different directions you could go. And then finally, they brought Huang right to this big door that said division headquarters over it. And then before division Huang could say anything, one of the two soldiers that was with him knocked on the door. And then before anybody could respond, that same soldier reached down, opened it up, swung the door in, and then they pushed Huang inside and they stepped in after him and shut the door behind them. In front of Huang was this big desk and sitting behind this desk was a very senior looking looking military official wearing a uniform. And this official, when they looked up and saw Huang standing there, they got up to their feet and put their hands on their gun and said, what are you doing here? How'd you get in here? And Huang, sensing there was something wrong, threw his hands up to show he was not a threat and pointed behind him and said, they brought me here. And the military official, who still had his hand on his gun, looked behind Huang and said, who brought you here? And Huang, he turned around and he saw the two soldiers who had picked him up and driven him here and led him to this room, they were gone. Which was impossible. Yo, 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 yo. <laughs> so you mean to tell me that, that, that like this, like he, he just like, like, like floated, like, lev like levitated all the way back there past these guys like a ghost. Like he's, 
a uh, fucking wand a uh, friendly ghost now, my nigga. Like, what is going on right now, dog? Like, what the hell? What? Up and driven him here and led him to this room? They were gone, which was impossible because Huang would have heard them leave. He didn't hear anything. The door never opened. They just somehow were gone. A second later, the senior military official had pulled out his radio and he was screaming commands. And then another second later, armed soldiers came running into the room. They grabbed Huang, who still had his hands up. They came in, they arrested Huang, and they began asking him all these questions about how he got in here. How did you get through the guards? Did you climb the fence? Did you cut the fence? You know, how did you get in here? It's not possible that you are here right now but Huang did not have any answers. Yo, like, I'm so confused too, like, nigga, like, what? Like, he clearly just came with some damn... <sighs> All he could say was, the two soldiers, they brought me here. A couple of days later, Huang would be bussed back to Beigao, and again, his friends and family and everybody in town had all these questions about what happened, what? but again, Huang just had no answers. And then just 11 days after coming back home the second time, Huang would disappear again. And this time he would tell people he encountered two men who told him they were the same two men from the other two times he had gone missing. You had the first instance where he woke up and two police officers in white picked him right. up off the ground right. and brought him to the deportation center. And then the second time was the military base where you had those two soldiers who brought him through the gates and brought right. him to division headquarters. Basically, these two men he encountered on the third trip were saying they were the same men across all three instances. And on this third instance that he went missing, Huang said these two men put him on their backs and they flew him to nine different cities around China for reasons unknown. And then they flew him. They put him on their backs and he flew. So now this nigga is fucking... Oh my god, like that these niggas the fucking Asian, I mean the Chinese Avengers now and shit. Like what the hell they got going on? Flying niggas on their backs to nine different countries? To nine different cities around cities. China for reasons unknown. And then they flew him back to Beigao and just dropped him off right outside his house near a tree. And that was it. Now, of course, this final disappearance sounds the most absurd because what? He was flying on the backs of people right. to all these different cities. That right. doesn't make any sense. But when Huang was kind of aggressively questioned about this third story, because it sounded the most made up as compared to the other two, right. it would turn out Huang had all this kind of insider information about each of the nine cities that he supposedly was flown to by these two men. He knew the weather in each of those cities on the night that he was gone. He knew what shows were playing on the night he was gone. And he also just had nice. really specific descriptions of where he was in each of these cities when they got there that all checked out. Now, you gotta remember that getting that information correct would have been really hard for Huang at the time. He did not have internet access, he didn't saying. have a phone, like he didn't have a car. I mean, he lives in an isolated small village in rural China. So the idea that literally the morning after all this happens, he's flown to these different cities, that he would have all this information perfectly correct, that's hard to do. That would be hard to lie about. Right. As of today, no one has ever been able to debunk Huang's stories. Basically, there's enough legitimacy and verifiable information in his stories that you really can't discount them. They really could have happened. Add in the fact that Huang actually took a lie detector test and passed it, and suddenly you're looking at a story what? that, as crazy as it sounds, really could have happened. Yo, ain't no way, dog. Ain't no way we got a, a, a human time traveler and shit like, like, like in the world. Now, I understand the world is a big place, bro. It, like, some people have have unnatural... I don't, I, I don't really know if I believe in, like, powers or not, bro, but it's like, nigga, how you wake up and you 700 miles, 600 miles away from your city? Like, like, uh, like you... Uh. And so Huang's story today is considered far and away the most famous UFO story in China's history. Bro, that's insane, because the leading bro. theory here is that Huang must have been abducted by aliens, and that's, that's how he's being moved around he, he all these places. To. And maybe those two men that kept showing up in each of these events were the extraterrestrials that had scooped him up. And Nobody and, knows, uh, but that is the theory. As for Huang, he wishes none of this had ever happened because his disappearances and whatever happened to him basically wrecked his life. 
his yeah. fiance broke up with him because she was so uncomfortable around him and there was a lot of stigma around Huang, especially in the village where everybody thought he was a liar. And then on top of that, all these news and mm, film and TV right. crews came to the village because they wanted to shoot shows and documentaries about Huang and Huang did not want anything to do with them. But again, like all these people are coming to the village for Huang and it's making the rest of the villagers upset. Yeah, yeah. And then also yeah, there was a really lengthy crazy, investigation man. by the police and by the military to try to figure out how in the world Huang got into that army base. I mean, there were layers and layers of security that he somehow like, got bro, through. And all those... Like, and again, with China strap, bro, they are strapped, nigga. They got somebody on every... Like, inch of a mansion, my nigga. So it's like, he's gonna be... It's damn near, like... I mean, it's worse than the damn White House. Like, they... Like, it's gonna be damn near impossible to get in there. And the fact that he can be able to... He just sneaked around and got to the main office where the guy's at with no one seeing him. Like, come on, God. Like, come on, man. Armed guards oh, man. that were watching the gates said they never saw Huang walk through, even though Huang said he literally just walked through the gate with the two soldiers that were carrying him through. And so today, Huang actually still lives in Beigao, and he had a son and a daughter, and he has grandkids, but he refuses to talk about what happened to him because, again, it wrecked his life. That's insane, bro. And again, bro, even with him, um, like, still, like, living today, bro, like, who knows if it's still happening to him or someone in his family at this point in time. Know what I'm saying? Like, that's insane, bro. That's insane. Mr. Ballin with it. Another fire video, man. He don't never let us down when it comes to these videos. And I appreciate y'all checking the video out, man. So, again, share the video. Hit the like button, man. So, that helps the video get seen. It really helps me out in the algorithm. Y'all don't understand how important hitting the like button is, man. Please hit that like button for me, man. Let's try to go viral with this one, man. And, um, S-R-T gang. I am out this thing, man. Let's get it.